welcome everyone welcome to the classification tree session in this session we will learn how to go about building a classification tree model on unbalanced data set for the purpose of our learning we have taken a banking problem statement assume my bank has executed a campaign to sell personal loans to their existing customers they are running a pilot campaign and the offer given to the customers is the bank is offering an attractive interest rate of 11 percentage one percentage lower than the prevailing market rate the offer of other competitors and the bank is waiving off the processing fee a pilot campaign is run targeting only 20000 customers the objective is from this pilot campaign bank wants to understand the profile of customers who would approach for personal loan going forward the bank would target only those kind of people who are more likely to take the personal loan so that is the objective and for this objective bank has nominated you to build their model after the campaign execution the campaign went on for a period of one month there were 1733 customers out of 20000 who responded to this offer bank has split this entire data into two data sets a development sample and a holdout development sample is your training set holdout is your testing set the data distribution in the two samples is also shown below the overall response is around 8.67 percentage so the problem statement the modeling objective statement for you is to build a classification tree model to build the model bank has obviously given you data the data of customers to whom they targeted and the customers who have responded so you have been given various fields as you can see here in sample data target is the column which captures who has responded and who has not those who have not responded are marked as zero in this sample all of these are marked zero but there are definitely records this is just a few records there are records where you will find the value as one also and there are certain input attributes the profile of the customers like age gender balance occupation how many credit transaction the customer was doing every quarter age has been bucketed as age bucket there is some internal generic score the bank has for their customers they have also provided you there is a banking parameter holding period which tells what is the ability of a customer to retain money in the account just like we have average balance there is another parameter ability to retain money in the account so these parameters are given target is your dependent variable age gender balance occupation number of credit transactions age bucket score holding period are your independent variables you have to build a model on this whenever you go about building model the first thing you should be doing is creating hypothesis how would age relate with target that is customer responding to the loan offer how would gender relate to the target phenomena you have to start making your own hypothesis for example my hypothesis would be male customers are more likely to respond as compared to female when i make this hypothesis what i am trying to say is 
if you target 100 male customers and 100 female customers and your overall average response rate is 8 percentage then probably out of 100 12 male would have responded and out of 100 four female would have responded because my hypothesis is saying male are more likely to respond so probably by doing some descriptive analysis and by doing some statistical analysis you can validate these hypotheses for example another hypothesis balance customers who maintain high balance in the account would be not requiring a personal loan are less likely to take a personal loan hypothesis so you should be making such hypothesis before you actually go into building the model all of this was covered in our hypothesis testing session as such i'm not going to repeat i'm now going to jump into building the classification tree model okay i have my jupyter notebook launched step one i import some of the basic packages which i require then i'll change my working directory dk2 analytics data file is the folder where my data files are located so i'll set the working directory these are the two files which we have to import dev sample and holdout sample dev sample is your training set holdout sample is your testing set so you have to import these two files I assume you would have downloaded these files from the net so you can see that downloaded from the net means our resource section you can see that it has got 14,000 and 6,000 observations let me display some initial few records instead of 50 let's display some 10 records and you can see in the target column there is 0 and 1 and there are other independent variables which we have described earlier let us see what is the total number of target equal to one so i'll do a value count so when you do a value count you can see there are target equal to one is 1235 in your training set we are running on the dev dev is your training set because we are going to first build model on the training set and 12,765 observations are marked as zero some total is 14,000 so we need to understand what is the response rate response rate is number of responders divided by total base campaign total campaign base so here you can see the response rate is 8.8 percentage we are using skykit learn package to build our model so what we'll have to do is for skykit learn we'll have to separate out our independent variables and dependent variables from the entire list of variables these are my independent variables so i'm capturing them separately as x in skykit learn you cannot have categorical variables what i mean by categorical variables occupation occupation has got values like self-employed salaried it is not a numerical value or gender male female you cannot have these kind of variables so what you have to do is you have to do dummy one hot encoding you will have to convert them into a one zero dummy matrix it is very easy to convert that into a dummy one zero matrix the function is get dummies sorry i did not run the above step so let's run that and we have got this so what you can see is gender gender variable which has got female male others there are three values in it 
you get three columns for it gender underscore f gender underscore m gender underscore o now whichever record has value f in that record the value of gender underscore f column will become one and the value for gender underscore m and zero will become zero whichever record has the value gender is equal to m male in that case gender underscore m will become one and gender underscore f and gender underscore o others will become zero this is how one hot encoding happens so for all the categorical variables gender occupation age bucket automatic one hot encoding has happened by the function get dummies let us just see the data you can see here the three columns which i just explained the concept of one hot encoding 0 1 0 0 1 0 1 0 0 this is how one hot encoding happens similarly one hot encoding for the occupation age bucket has happened now we require the target variable to be captured we'll call it as y train let us just print the type so my this x train is a data frame it has all numeric values now which you can see from above there is no categorical column and y train is one single column of type series okay having done all of this basics we are now ready to run our decision tree classifier we will import the decision tree classifier package we have to build the classification tree we create a classification tree object with certain parameter setting the different parameters that we have to set for this we we want to see what all parameter options we can pass here my cursor is blinking very, very close to decision tree classifier bracket i just press the shift tab button okay because i have not loaded the package it is not giving me help let me just first run this i have executed okay now let me see the help shift tab now it is going to give you the help so there are many parameters which i can set criteria splitter max step min samples and so forth okay i have chosen certain parameters i'll explain those parameter we are making use of cart technique cart technique uses gini gain calculation as such i have said criteria equal to gini min sample split what it is trying to say is you continue splitting the nodes so long as a given node has more than 30 records if a given node has say 32 records you will again apply your gini gain logic on that node find out which variable is best and split that into two child node now it may so happen the node having 32 records has got split and the two child nodes you have got has got 16 observation in left child and 16 observation in right child now you think of one of the node where you have got 16 observation say the left node the number of observation 16 is now less than 30 this criteria says that you cannot further split it so that is min sample split similarly we have one more parameter saying min sample leaf leaf node is also called as terminal node what this criteria min sample leaf is saying any terminal node should have certain number of observation what is that certain number of observation i have configured here 10 if i say it has to be 100 with min sample split 30 i cannot say 100 because that is a wrong parameter 
if min sample split is 30, I need to have min sample leaf which is less than min sample split. And typically it is set as one third. So 30, one third is 10. Max depth. I've set the max depth to be 50. I've just arbitrarily set max depth as 50. At the same time, the min sample split of 30, min sample leaf of 10, these values are too small. Max depth of 50 is too large. Because of these values, I will get a tree which will have many levels. And this tree having many levels will be a overfit model. What is overfit? We'll learn and understand shortly. The right criteria for min sample split should be and at the same time min sample leaf should be this should be at least 5 percentage of the population minimum 5 percentage and this should be at least 2 percentage of the population on which you are building the model. See, the point is, if I have got 14,000 observations and I get a terminal load only having 10 observations, that 10 observation will become one of my segment for targeting or not targeting. Even if that 10 observation becomes a segment for targeting, the number of observation 10 as a percentage of 14,000 is hardly 10 percentage would be 1400, 1 percentage would be 140, 0.1 percentage is 14. So it would be less than 0.1 percentage. I would not like to target base from my marketing purpose, which is just 0.1 percentage of the total data available for campaigning. I require reasonable sized segments. To have reasonable size segments, you need terminal node should be at least 2% re of reasonable size where you will enjoy doing the marketing. Now, if this is 2%, if I say the leaf has to be one third of the split, then the above should be 6%. So the parameter setting is accordingly done. However, I am setting these values too small and then depth I am setting too large. Because of this, I will end up having a model which is going to be overfit. Now, I've used the term overfit multiple times. What is overfitting? Overfitting is a phenomena in model development where the model which is being developed fits extremely well on the training set on the development set it will give you very good model performance measure now this model you then apply on a testing set or an unknown set the model will perform miserably bad why? The reason is the model fit on the training set got so customized that it can work only on that training set only. The moment you try to use it on an unknown data, the model is not able to correctly predict. That is called as overfitting. And we have to avoid overfitting. How do we avoid overfitting? We avoid overfitting by using concept like validation, cross validation, training testing, building a model on a training set, then testing on a testing set that is called a validation approach. So we are going to use those phenomena, those uh, uh, functionalities. But for now, I have just set certain parameters for the decision tree classifier and with that decision tree classifier parameters I have fit a model on this data. 
how good is the model and how is the plot so here i have written a plot code let me try executing this to see whether my plot is going to come properly if not then probably i'll run the below syntax okay uh, i have made the changes the code which was earlier did not have this line sklearn import so i've written that and the feature list was not created properly this is what i have uh, written so now this code has worked i have executed this code and i'm not going to re-execute because it takes some time to create this graph this decision tree plot now you can see the plot is the tree is very large and because of that we will not be able to make any interpretation one of the benefit of a decision tree technique is it gives you output in a tree like format a hierarchical tree like format as such the interpretation is intuitive but when the tree becomes so large the benefit no longer exists because you will not be able to read this and interpret this anyways let's move forward our model has been created and we have shown the model the model is in this clf and which step the model got created the model got created in this step when we did the fit in this step we have just made the plot okay now we'll use this model to make prediction so here i have got my predict function on the training set i'm still working on the training data the, i learned on the training set i am making prediction on the training set i am trying to see how good the model has fit on the training set so when you run this you will get the predicted values and our input values are 0 1 so you get this predicted values how do i evaluate the model to evaluate the model there are various model performance measures in balanced data set we can use classification accuracy however when we talk of unbalanced data set classification accuracy is not a desired model performance measure anyways first i'll run classification accuracy and show you that output and then i will explain why classification accuracy is not the right way of measuring a model if it is an unbalanced data set and then we will move on to another model performance measure that is AUC ROC curve area under curve so let me first see classification accuracy my classification accuracy has come out to be 92.3 percentage I've got such a high accuracy classification accuracy now why this classification accuracy does not make sense the reason is in our data what is the proportion of responder we already saw what is the proportion of responder somewhere here in a above step which is here it is 0 0.088 that is 8.88 8.82 percentage so let me just note down the proportion of 
responder in our data set is 0 0.0882 that is 8.82 percentage there are two classes in our data the labeled column has two classes that is one for responder and zero for non responder ones are 8.82 percentage zeros that is non responders are 1 minus 8.82289812981 and here 981 and 9 so 91.18 percentage if i don't build a model and i simply predict i'm making a very important statement so kindly hear it properly i do not make a model and i make prediction every record belongs to non responder class that is every record is zero if i do that prediction all zeros in the data are correctly predicted and all ones are wrongly predicted if i simply say all record belong to zero class if i make this simple statement all record belong to zero class all zeros are correctly predicted all ones are wrongly predicted which means without even building a model i've got an accuracy of 91.18 percentage and that accuracy you are just increased from 91.18 to 92.3 percentage there is no drastic improvement in your accuracy this is the point when we have an unbalanced data set we do not use accuracy as model performance measure accuracy should be used as a model performance measure only when your data is a balanced data set i hope you have understood we now move to another model performance measure which is called auc before i run some more codes I would like to switch to my PowerPoint presentation. This is where I have the explanation of AUC. So let us try to understand AUC. This is a confusion matrix. In a confusion matrix, you have actual, actual one and zero predicted predicted is what the model is predicting and model will predict one or zero the moment you see this kind of a table many people gets confused and that's why it is called confusion matrix however it is not complicated it is very simple you are just creating a cross tab of the actual classes and versus the predicted classes so in this confusion matrix here you are going to write the numbers which were actually one and you predicted one if a observation was belonging to responder class and the model predicted as responder it was a correct prediction if the actual was responder but model predicted zero it is a wrong prediction 
So what we call them as true positive. One is positive, zero is negative. So one is actual, I predicted correctly, true positive. And here I predicted zero, but it was actually one. That's why we call as false negative. How do you relate this true positive or false negative? Let me take a simple example of COVID. You do COVID test. You are actually a person who has got COVID, but the report says you do not have COVID. Because the report says you do not have COVID, you are not going to take the treatment required for COVID. This is false negative. Similarly, you do not have COVID. Report says you have COVID and you are now subjected to quarantine and all the treatment related to COVID. You are predicted as having COVID and you are giving COVID treatment. This is false positive. Both of these scenarios, false negative and false positive are not desirable, which means they are wrong predictions. This is true negative. Someone is negative, that is non-responder or in terms of COVID example, does not have COVID and the report, the test report also says the person does not have COVID. So this is just first explanation of the table. So here we know these are correct predictions. These are wrong predictions. If I sum total the total number of predictions which are wrong divided by total observation, that is error. If I do a sum total of total predictions which are correct divided by total observations, that is accuracy. So I have defined accuracy and error. Now we come across two important terms which is called sensitivity and specificity. We focus for sensitivity. Let me just erase the inks. For sensitivity, we focus on the actual positive. Out of the total positive cases, what percentage of cases I am able to correctly predict? It is called sensitivity. And out of the total negative cases, what percentage of cases I am able to correctly predict using my model, using my testing tool is called specificity. The definition of specificity and sensitivity, you will not remember. Don't try to remember also. Whenever you feel I want to know of the total positives, what percentage of positives I am able to correctly predict, that is sensitivity. But whether it is called sensitivity or specificity, if you are getting confused, go to Google search, simply type what is sensitivity, what is specificity. Point is, we should understand that there is some statistics called sensitivity and specificity. Definition remembering is not required. Okay. Now let us try to understand how AUC is plotted. When we are making a prediction using the predict function, when we are using these predict functions, where is that predict? Yeah, here. When we are using these predict functions on the data, the model is applied based upon the values in that row. 
the model evaluates and then predict whether it will belong to zero class or one class. But the decision whether it will belong to zero or one is taken based on probability. So where does this probability come into picture? What happens is when you run these syntaxes, first you estimate what is the likelihood of this customer belonging to zero class, non-responder class. If the probability of belonging to non-responder class is say 70 percentage, what is the probability it will belong to responder class? We know probability does not exceed 1. If the probability of belonging to non-responder is 0 0.7, the probability of belonging to responder will be 1 minus 0 0.7, that is 0 0.3. This is simple probability. So depending upon the probabilities, if the probability is above 0.5, Typically, these algorithms are designed to say that observation will be marked as 1. If the probability of not responding is above 0.5, then you will say it is likely to be non-responder and will get marked as 0. So these probability calculations happens in the background. Coming back. So, I, I have built a model. And using the model, I have computed the probability for each record. And I'll talk in terms of responder. I have computed the probability of each record and what is the likelihood of the, rec the observation being a responder. For that, I have got the probabilities. If I now make a statement, Assume you consider probability greater than equal to zero. Any customer having a probability greater than equal to zero, I will say that customer is likely to be one, that is responder. The moment I make this statement greater than equal to zero, you will think probability range is zero to one. And I already said greater than equal to zero which means I'm going to mark actually everyone one. If I predict everyone, all the record to be belonging to class responder, class one, my sensitivity will be 100 percentage. My sensitivity will be one and specificity will be zero. So here I have taken this point probability cutoff at this probability cutoff. I'm saying anyone who belong anyone having probability greater than zero. It will be one in that case. My sensitivity becomes one specificity becomes zero on this plot. Red line is sensitivity and specificity zero. Now I take the other extreme. I say Anyone having a probability less than equal to one. I will predict it to belong to zero class. Now you will think probability cannot exceed one. I am saying less than equal to one, which means practically I am saying everyone belong to class zero. That is non responder. If I mark everyone non responder, my sensitivity will become zero because now I have not predicted anyone belonging to responder class and my specificity will become one. This is the other extreme as shown in this chart. So here sensitivity is one specificity is zero. I can now change the cutoff. I can say if the probability is above 0.1, then 1, else 0. If the probability is above 0.2, then 1, else 0. This way I can keep changing the cutoff. And as I keep changing the cutoff, my sensitivity graph will move like this downwards and my specificity graph will move like this upward. This is just first to understand the concept. Depending upon the cutoff you choose, 
your sensitivity and specificity will keep changing now how this change in sensitivity and specificity is used to create a plot called area under curve is what we are going to see in the next slide now let's see how the sensitivity and specificity is used to create auc roc curve auc stands for area under the curve roc stands for receiver operating characteristic curve from the name auc roc it would be very obvious the the model performance measure was not designed specifically for this one zero problem in machine learning it was defined for some other industry and that other industry where it was defined was one of that industry that is telecom industry how good is the receiver able to receive the voice signal transmitted by the speaker on the other hand on the other side of the uh, phone connection okay so the plot of auc roc is created by taking sensitivity on your y axis and one minus specificity on the x axis obviously when you see this graph what you would want is you would want high sensitivity and high specificity why high sensitivity and high specificity because sensitivity stands for true positive what percentage of total positives are correctly predicted and specificity stands for what percentage of total negatives which are correctly predicted and obviously i don't want i i obviously i want to predict i want to predict both the positives correctly and the negatives correctly so i want both the values to be high sorry so the auc roc curve is plotted by having sensitivity versus one minus specificity the total area of this is one basically it's a plot the value of one minus specificity can go up to one sensitivity can go up to one this image should have been square not a rectangle the total area is one when you have this sensitivity versus one minus specificity you get this kind of a curve the blue colored curve is what you're going to get by changing the probability cutoffs by changing the probability cutoffs you keep noting what is sensitivity if i take a probability cutoff of zero what is sensitivity what is specificity if i take a probability cutoff of 0 0.01 what is sensitivity what is the specificity if i take a probability cutoff of 0 0.02 like this you keep changing the probability cutoff and you get sensitivity specificity and you create a plot and in this plot this area which is below the curve which i am now shading as red lines let me just quickly jump to the end this total area which is below the curve is called area under the curve area under curve the abbreviated thing is AUC. Higher the AUC, better is the model. The general interpretation is if your model AUC is 0.9 and above, you have got an excellent model. If it is between 0.8 to 9, 0.9, it is a good model. If it is below 0.6, you have just got a poor model, very poor model. So this is the model performance measure to be used when you are having a unbalanced data set. Now for this unbalanced data set, we will go back to our Jupyter notebook. And for your information, this entire thing is available in my blog series, which is here. Okay. Coming back to Jupyter notebook, I've explained AUC. Let us see 
what is the AUC for our model? This is the syntax in Python. The AUC of our model is 0.92 and the interpretation as we saw, if your AUC is above 0.9, you've got an excellent model. I use the model on the training set. I developed the model on the training set. I'm applying the model on the training set. I got a 0.92. The real measure how good your model is will be when you test the model on a testing set or the holdout. We now have to apply this model on the holdout. On the holdout, we have the X variable, the transformations that you did on the development has to be done on the holdout also. So we do that get dummies transformation. This test will pass to the model predict function and on that predict, we'll first see what is the accuracy score. Accuracy score is 91.3. Anyways, I'm not much interested in accuracy score because we know accuracy is not reliable model performance measure for unbalanced data. So I'll focus on AUC. So this is the code for AUC. My AUC has come out to be 0.68. Compare the AUC on your training model with the AUC on your testing data set. There's a sharp difference. On one side you had 0.92, other side you got 0.68. This is an overfit model. The model is working extremely well on training and working very poorly on testing set. So we have to now understand the concept of cross validation. Now before I execute some codes on cross validation, let us try to understand the concept of cross validation, how it works. In cross validation, the data on which you build the model is is partitioned. So I have to say what is my cross validation parameter? I want a X fold cross validation. So X fold cross validation or K fold cross validation. I have to set the parameter K. Let us say the parameter K is set to 10. That is thumb rule. Most of the time you will be using K equal to 10 cross fold of 10. The data which you pass to the algorithm will be broken down into 10 partitions randomly, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. A record in the development set will not be part of two partitions. It will belong to only one partitions. So you get 10 partitions of the data randomly created. That is step one. All this will happen in the background automatically. Now from the 10 partitions in first fold, you will consider nine partitions as the training set. The 10th partition, you will apply the model, use it as testing. I'm just focusing on the development data. I have got my separate holdout data set, which I'm not using. I'm just using the development data set on which I'm building the model. That data has been partitioned into 10, nine partitions used in fold one, 10th partition you're using for scoring purpose, for computing your model performance measure, in this case, AUC. Then in second fold, you will take other nine partitions. One of the training partition will now become test and you're going to apply the model on this test. This way you will have 10 folds because we have set cross validation equal to 10. So when you have executed the 10 folds, you will have 10 model performance measure, 10 AUC values. Average of those 10 will be calculated 
and that average is what you can expect as a AUC when you deploy the model on the testing data, your holdout data. So this approach gives you a reliable estimate of how good your model will work when you use it on an unknown data set. This is the concept of cross validation. The concept of cross validation is used to get a real and uh, get a appropriate accurate estimate of model performance when deployed on a unknown data set. That is the main concept here. So here what we are going to now do we'll use this cross val score function. We'll call this cross well score function the classifier object we created will pass as a parameter the training data we are giving is parameter and we are saying that we want a 10 fold cross validation what will be the model performance measure i am saying roc auc will be my model performance measure the model will be built i'll get 10 values i'll compute the average of those 10 values and that average is the expected AUC when I deploy the model on testing data. So let's just see that we have deployed this and built a cross validated model. It is giving me AUC of 0.694 the 10 scores if you want to see these are the 10 scores which have been calculated in the background training testing all happening in the background I now use that cross validated model on the test data set to see what is my AUC my AUC on the test is 0.68 and the cross validated score also suggested 0.69 these two values of AUC are very close to each other so the model which we developed the classifier model which we developed we can expect the model to give us an AUC of around 0.68 when we deploy on a unknown data set so that is cross validation concept. Then there are further more concepts. We have built the model and while building the model, I set the parameters. For this classifier, we had set the parameters. The parameters are above. I need to scroll further. 30, 10 and 50. Why 50? Why not 60 or why not 10? Why 30? Why not 300? And why not 100? I had arbitrarily set the parameters. What is the right combination? What should be the right values? If I really want to find out, then we need to build many models we need to build many models where i try many combinations i build a model with max depth of 10 i build a model with a max depth of 50 i build a model with a max depth of 100 however it will be very difficult for me to keep trying many parameters manually as such, Python provides you a functionality called grid search cross validation. In a grid search cross validation, what you can do is you can set various parameters. For example, I am saying the splitting criteria, I want to try out Gini, I want to try out Anthropy. Anthropy is your C5.0, that technique. 
where you make use of the information gain formulae. Max depth. I want to try building model with a max depth of 3, max depth of 4, max depth of 5. So I have given a range. Between 3 to 10, try out various max depth. I can here make parameters for min sample split also. But for the sake of training and for demonstration, I have just playing around with two parameters. Criteria, max depth. Other parameters I have just simply hard coded. What will this do? This will now create many models. How many levels are there for criteria? Criteria has got two levels. Range max depth has how many levels? Max depth has levels of 3 to 10. 10 is excluded. So it has got 6 levels. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Sorry, 7 levels. 7 levels, not 6. It has 7 levels. 7 levels of this, 2 levels of criteria, which means in the background, now I am going to build model 14 times using a grid search cross validation. If I have min sample split also and I create say another five levels min sample split is created. In that case it will become 2 into 7 14 and 14 into 5 that is 70. 70 combinations will be tried. If then I add min sample leaf with 5 levels, it will become 70 into 5, 350. So 350 models will be built in the background. And from that 350, using a cross validation, it will tell us which combination is the best. That is the concept of grid search cross validation. And this is where real machine learning comes into play as a data scientist. I now do not put much effort on, on finding what is the best combination. As a data scientist, I simply parameterize thing. Computer will keep doing the hard work. And after the computer has done hard work, I will simply say, what is the best params? Give me that combination. So this is the concept of grid search cross validation. So let's get going, execute this. So here you can see fitting 10 folds on 14 candidates. Each is done with a cross validation because we have set cross validation also 10. So fitting 10 folds with 14 candidates of grid search cross validation. So in all 140 models have been built. Here there's a detailed output which is going on, which has happened. After that, the code is executed. Yeah, this cell number has been populated. Star is not there, which means code has successfully executed completion. What is the best combination? Okay, it is saying that Gini should have been used with a max depth of 6. There is no need of going to 50. This is my best parameter. So I can now take this best estimator, capture it in this classifier that will become my model and that uh, classifier object on that classification object I can fit the model and use it. So with this combination if I now try I have got AUC of 0.76 and here if you see with my previous combination I had got AUC of 0.69 this 0.69 was with Suboptimal con combination. This suboptimal combination was here, which we defined, but with the cross validation and grid search, I have got a optimal combination which has improved my AUC by 10 percentage, almost more than 10 percentage, and my AUC is now 0.76. Let me see whether it is holding 
on the holdout set because the real test is model working on holdout set on the holdout set i get auc of 0.75 very close to 0.76 i have got a decently good model using the classification tree technique We will now quickly make a visual plot of our model. So our classify object in the tree plot tree function will pass that. The feature list we had already created earlier. So I can use that same thing. Let me run this code. Okay, it's given an error. Decision tree classify object has no attribute plot tree. Okay, there's some error in this. Rather than bothering about that, let me try the other syntax for now. Okay, I have corrected the code. These two lines I've just introduced and executed. Not sure why these two lines had to be repeated because we had imported this package right in the beginning when we made the above plot but anyways by writing these two lines the code has executed so for now we have got our decision tree classifier output still this model seems to be complex not easily interpretable but anyways what is more important is when we deploy the model we have to use this object on the new records and we'll be able to make the prediction and we have been able to increase the model performance by using a grid search cross validation from 0 0.69 0 0.68 to 0 0.75 that is a drastic improvement in the code below there is earlier versions of code where we had export graph viz being used now because of the functionality which is available here plot tree we don't require this thing so i just uncomment these previous code of mine and here is the code by which you can export it also i simply uncomment them let me see if there is any other concepts which is left. There's a, a simple concept which is called as a randomized cross validation search. Just like we have a grid search cross validation, there is another Python function called randomized search cross validation. I leave that as a homework for you to try out how to make use of randomized search cross validation while building machine learning models final slide advantages and disadvantages it provides intuitive tree but by now we have seen that when the tree becomes so long that intuitiveness is gone and simple to understand and interpret again when the tree is long large it does not remain simple to understand and interpret. Yeah, the main advantage is we require very little data preparation. Outlier treatment is not required. Disadvantage, the main disadvantage of classification tree models is classification tree models do not give very good model on unbalanced data set. This is the model which we built on an unbalanced data set. Probably if I use other technique like logistic regression technique or probably if I use a neural network technique or bagging and boosting technique as against classification tree technique, I will be able to get a higher AUC than what I got 
in this model. So when do you use classification tree? You should use classification tree as an initial step of model development, not going to high depths, having only three or four levels depth. So the output is intuitive. You can figure out which variable is coming significant and how the data is being cut. So when you go only three or four levels, you will be able to nicely visualize the output. Get insights from the output and then take those insights to advanced machine learning techniques. Logistic regression, gradient boosting techniques, random forest, support vector machines, neural networks. So that's how you should be using classification tree as a initial model approach, not the final model on the data for which you are building. Second application, when your data is not large, if you have a small data set and few attributes only, then probably you may use a classification tree technique. I hope you enjoyed the session. With this, I end the classification tree technique. Thank you. Bye bye. See you in the upcoming session.